On the 18th of November 1952, U.S. Navy Lieutenant Royce Williams and his wingmen were part of a combat air patrol above the Sea of Japan when seven bogies were seen, even though completely outclassed. The Americans climbed to 26,000 feet. Williams pulled hard left and lined up on MiG number 4. He fired a short burst and the MiG went down, followed by Williams' wingman. Williams was now alone and facing six MiG-15s. You're listening to the podcast, so there I was. It's how all great aviation tales begin. Welcome to episode 45, Fig. 45. That's a good caliber, too. It is a good caliber. (laughs) And uh, although I think the caliber was a little bigger, what's the title of this show? Four MiG kills, one fight. Yeah. Yes. I didn't ask what the caliber of the cannon was on that F-9F Panther that Captain Williams was flying that day. Well, then Lieutenant Williams. Fig, I don't know about you, and no disrespect to all of our other guests, but that has been not only the highlight of of our podcast, it's one of the highlights of my life. Almost 98. Sharp as a tank. Took out four MiGs in a 1v7 fight. Possibly a fifth. Uh, and it could never be talked no, about. He kept it silent for fifty more than 50 years. Didn't even tell his wife or his children about it until it was declassified. Our gratefulness, our appreciation to Captain Williams for joining us, and, and I hope he will come back. I, it sounds like he may want to, so that was good. Well, he his his stories uh, just, well, first of all, we, we spent a lot of time on the, on the MIG engagement, but his career spanned 37 right. years. And he flew, well, let's just say this. He, if it wasn't made, he didn't fly it if it was a fighter. Yeah. <laughs> From World War II uh, through Vietnam, if it, right. I mean, really. Because uh, he did an exchange with the Air Force, so he flew Air Force medal. Like I said, if uh, you could list the jets you didn't fly, it'd probably be a shorter list. So. <laughs> right. That was, yeah, that was pretty much spot on. I, I, was, I got half a page worth of airplane yeah. notes here. So. That was awesome. You know, Hellcat, Bearcat, Corsair, Cougars, Panthers, F nine F, Cougars, F eighty six, F one hundred, F four A four, and I'm sure. Uh, did I yes. say F one hundred? Yeah, you did. I think I did. Yeah, uh, but and they and then out of nowhere he starts talking about oh being on fire in an F four two engines. Uh, they had lost a bunch of them already and. Everybody had jumped out, and he thought, well, this one's still flying. I'm going to try to bring it back, and his backseater <laughs> jumped out. I'm out of here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, uh, they, they were able to figure out what was going on with these planes because he true. brought one back. Probably saved some lives. I could be wrong. Story. Save some more lives. About crossing the pond. Oh, my God. Yeah. What, night, a, what well, an amazing day. And the world's smallest Let's just get out of the way and listen to what he has to say. On the tanker. Here he is, without further ado, weather. Captain Williams. Oh, and to the uh, tanker crew who uh, did that. Thanks a lot. We really appreciated that. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. Well, there I was. Crossing the pond, and you could see that I wasn't exactly fun. So there I was. Which is how all great aviation tales start. And this is going to be an amazing aviation tale. This is Fig. Welcome to the podcast. So there I was with my co horse, Repeat. Where are you today, Repeat? I'm in an undisclosed location. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere in the country i don't know I'm, I'm i'm warm and dry but uh where i am doesn't matter where we are is with a legend of naval aviation <laughs> yes uh, and we are so honored this is going to be the greatest of aviation tales captain williams united states navy retired recipient of the navy cross captain williams welcome sir thank you so much so, Captain Williams, do you mind me stating your age, sir? No, I'm uh, about one month away from 98. Beautiful. That is amazing. So amazed. So, I read a little bit through your bio. You went in the Navy shortly after Pearl Harbor, was it? I first joined the Army. I was 16, but when I turned 17, I was eligible for the V-5 aviation 
cadet program in the Navy, and I made the switch. Nice. That is awesome. So how did you become interested in aviation, sir? Well, I first flew when I was four, and uh, barnstormers would come through the area. My brother and I would run out to greet them. (laughs) Uh, A friend of mine became a barnstormer, and for the sake of flying, I'd go with him to county fairs, sell tickets, wipe the airplane down, enjoy the aerobatic demonstration, and uh, at least get to fly both ways with him. Well, wow, that's pretty awesome. That's very cool. Do you remember what, what kind of airplane was it? Yes, a uh, Travel Air. Okay. Travel Air. Nice. Nice. You became eligible to join the Air Cadet program. Can you walk us through what that commissioning source was like? Did you have to go to, to boot camp and then OCS? How, how did that work in those days? Yes, I came into the Navy as a selectee for aviation, but I went to boot camp and following that, to a squadron at Corpus Christi, waiting uh, space around the end of 1943. It happened, and I switched into a cadet program and started in the various schools that that uh, encompassed. Okay. Oh, that's amazing. Captain Williams, what aircraft did you train in initially uh, through your... An N-3. N-3, Okay. And then when you got to the fleet, what year was it that you actually got to a fleet squadron? 1946, uh, 45, late 45. So all the action was over. Yes. Yes. All that training and nothing to do with it, right, sir? (laughs) (laughs) Can't blame me. (laughs) That's probably good. That's probably a good thing. There were an awful lot of casualties in the aviation training, especially the Army Air Force lost an awfully lot of their cadets. Uh, Not so bad in the Navy. I lost a few friends, but uh, basically went as scheduled. Yeah, and unfortunately that that hasn't changed a whole lot. We continue to, uh, uh, to lose people in training. Just true. So you got to your first fleet squadron at the end of 1945. Did you stay on active duty in the Navy, or were you? did you go into the reserves? No, I was a reserve, but I was selected for regular Navy, and I remained in it for 37 years. All right. <laughs> Can't stick with anything, can you, sir? <laughs> Couldn't even do the full 40. <laughs> wow. That's not the, they kicked me out. Oh, there you go, right? What was the training like, both to get your wings and then afterward? I imagine it was, well, let me let me just not imagine anything. Could, well, see, this is before simulator. That uh, You didn't have a simulator to sit in and fly before you got in the airplane, right? They pretty much handed you an ATOPS manual and said, go, go get it. Basically, it was just showing me how to start it. <laughs> I didn't, didn't read an ATOPS manual. Oh, my gosh. They'd get you in the cockpit, point to a few interesting items like stick and throttle. So I tell you how to start it. Good luck. There's uh, an attitude indicator, um, a slip indicator to keep keep the ball in the center. Sure, sure. And uh, a great view. We'll just look around and Keep, keep the blue side up. And uh, <laughs> and step on the ball, right? Right. Yes, indeed. Sure. Before we get into the bigger story that we first read about you, I want to ask, do you have any memories? Uh, what was the funniest thing you saw either in boot camp or officer candidate school or in Navy flight training or, for that matter, any at any time in your Navy career? Might have been funny to some people, but uh, it was serious. I came out late for a flight in a steerman, and uh, the the instructor was ready to go, so I jumped in, and away we went. And wow, uh, so the next thing he did, he got up to a couple of thousand feet, and he did a slow roll. I hadn't uh, fastened my parachute, and I hadn't buckled it in, so I was <sighs> hanging on to 
anything I could grab. Oh, dear God. Stable. <laughs> no. no. Oh. While, you were, while you were in this slow roll, you were about to fall out of the cockpit. Yes, yes. Oh, no canopy to stop me. No. And you weren't even strapped into the parachute. That is uh, terrifying. Oh. Terrifying. Yeah, that, that's right up there. The most terrifying <laughs> stories we've heard. Oh. <laughs> that is terrifying. Uh, that's probably one of many. Oh, but. My goodness. Well, if it, if it gets worse than that, I don't even want to know about it because my palms now my palms are sweating just thinking about that. I have nightmares about right? things like that. That's like showing the nightmare showing up to school naked. No, going flying without strapping in. <laughs> Similar. Yeah, in an open <laughs> cockpit, upside down. <laughs> oh. But, well, I, uh, I guess let's get into it. The, the fact is, uh, you did find yourself in a in a far more terrifying situation. Hey, wait, before you go there, Captain Williams, What? so your first fleet squadron that you were in, uh, what aircraft was that? What aircraft did you fly? Hellcats. I, uh, Hellcats. I flew FBD in training, but then I was selected for fighters. Went to F, the 6F training down at Opalaka, Miami, Florida, and uh, carrier qualified on the USS Ranger CV-4, uh, Captain McCain okay. commanding. So that was uh, Senator John McCain's father or, or grandfather? That would have been his father. Grandfather. Grandfather, okay. Grandfather. Okay. Grandfather. So Hellcats, your first fleet squadron so did you fly hellcats until you transitioned to jets or did you fly something in between hellcats and f9fs i next flew uh, corsairs <sighs> out of los alamitas well an interesting thing i first went on the fdr shortly after that transferred to the princeton the princeton was carrying emmanuel cuisine's body the president of the Philippines, who spent much of the years in the United States and died here, uh, through the Panama Canal, San Diego. And there we got a group of uh, Naval Academy, Lieutenant JGs, uh, that had just gotten their wings. They had spent tours in surface craft uh, in combat. And we were going from a support squadron, the saddest, where the maintenance was done by a maintenance squadron. Now, a squadron was going to do everything, and we needed trained uh, department heads and so forth. So they stepped in, and I stepped out. <laughs> I went to Los Alamitas. Uh, my brother was stationed over at El Toro, just a short distance away. Right. And matter of fact, when I uh, did my initial uh, flying, he was the guy that uh, gave me the checkout. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, in the Corsair? So uh, if you had to pick... Those are cool airplanes. I would uh, gladly cut off one of my testicles to fly either one of those aircraft right now. What, what, uh, I had a better one. Follow, oh. Following that, I went into the F-8 Bearcats, <sighs> my, oh my favorite. Right. Oh, man. What great airplanes. I am so jealous. <sighs> right. I made... Uh, Two South Pacific tours in uh, the Princeton in uh, fighter squadrons. And I came back from that, and in as much as I had been selected for regular Navy, they wanted all their pilots to have at least two years of college, and I was out of high school. So they sent me to the University of Minnesota for 18 months, and I got a four year degree, and uh, they sent me on to PG school. Okay, PT. PT school. PG, oh, postgraduate. Oh, postgraduate, okay. Oh, okay. PG, postgraduate. Got it, okay. So you got a four, you got a four-year degree in 18 months, and then you went to postgraduate school. Boy, you uh, couldn't do that today. No. Yeah. Repeat. No, I, I, I couldn't do I could. that. So. <laughs> so your undergraduate degree, would you say, was the University of Minnesota? Yes. Was that because you, you hail from South Dakota originally, right? Yes, at age 11, my dad got his World War II bonus, and uh, it allowed him to select uh, to run a grocery store on his own. And looking around, we found 
uh, appropriate storefront on the other side of Big Stone Lake, the uh, border lake between South Dakota and Minnesota. And uh, so well, just a short distance from where I grew up, but uh, now in Minnesota. Nice. Well, now that we've established he's flown every single aircraft, I thought. I, every cool airplane on the planet, right? <sighs> right. So after, uh, I guess after Corsairs, you transitioned to F9Fs at some point? Yeah. After your, you got all educated, <laughs> educated up. <laughs> right. So the jet transition, how long was that? Well, it was in a squadron. It wasn't a okay. transition. It was somebody told me how to start the airplane. Yeah. <laughs> Repeat, this is right out of, uh, right out of those uh, old squadron files that I found where uh, they transitioned to j- jets uh, on in one day. Right. They handed them and uh, yeah, yes, there was there was no TC, no no, no two seat no. F nines, correct, sir? Why not? Oh. <laughs> Here are the keys. Don't screw it up. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> wow. Yeah, you, uh, I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't fly two seat airplanes until I got in the Phantom. Unbelievable. Wow. No kidding. So. uh so, so what time frame does that put you at uh, when you first got into the F-9? Is this late 40, early 50s? 1952. Okay, so it was 52. You were brand new to the airplane then, or relatively brand new to the airplane when you found yourself uh, in the North Pacific off the coast of uh, North Korea. Yes, I suppose I had, you know, almost 100 oh, hours. <laughs> almost, almost 100 wow. hours. That's that's crazy. Because this is what you did was, well, let, I guess let's get into it. Can you tell us about that day when you woke up, what the brief was like, what you were supposed to be doing, and then, and then what happened to find yourself completing one of the greatest accomplishments in the history of aviation, all aviation? Yeah. We arrived at uh, our standard operating area off the coast of of Korea uh, at about the uh, border, 38th parallel, border between North and South Korea. And pretty much the Navy was responsible for the war on the eastern half of uh, North Korea. It didn't allow us to spend a a lot of time to attention to some of the more potent targets near the Yellow River, which was the border between China and North Korea and Russia, Soviet Union and uh, North Korea. So uh, Admiral Jocko Clark, who was uh, Task Force 77, came up with the idea of moving a pretty good sized task force north to where these targets would be well within our range. So at night, a group of three carriers and escorts, maybe 20, including the battleship um, that was the command um, center for Jack and Clark, moved up off Changin, a city on the coast, a major city on the coast of North Korea, and probably about 100 miles south of Vladivostok. Okay. And we were out from Chongjin uh, and uh, arriving in the morning, I was on the first flight and uh, with carrier airplanes from all three carriers. And I was in the very first group that hit the target at the city of Orion that had a lot of uh, manufacturing and warehousing. Yeah, military-type targets, yeah. We uh, pretty much tore that up uh, while the people across the river, the Soviets, got pretty excited and uh, a lot of chatter, and they launched a lot of airplanes and uh, showed keen interest. Well, I went back and made my landing, and bad weather had moved in. A blizzard frontal system, and I was told on the landing to get a quick lunch 
come back because I was going to be on the combat air patrol, which I did. Three, four, four of us uh, briefed together, took off in miserable weather, joined up, and then climbed through the cl clouds to clear sky above at 12,000 feet. And in the clouds, CIC informed us that there were a group of uh, unknown aircraft coming from the north and for us to be heads up. You know, once coming into clear air, I saw a flight of seven uh, in wing fingertip formation uh, heading our way all in contrail, probably 50,000 feet or maybe higher. They wow. often flew to 55,000. So they said, uh, that's your target. My uh, flight leader had a, a warning light uh, in his fuel system. And so he was directed with his wingman to return to over the task force while well, I took the lead with a wingman that I'd never flown with before. Oh. And uh, tested my guns and gun sight and everything was ready to fight and climbed in the direction uh, that I saw them. As they went over, so they turned back north and uh, we were climbing to engage if possible, if necessary. And at 26,000 feet, they broke up in two groups and uh, descended from the contrails and we lost sight of them. And I reported that to the carrier and they lost sight of them as well as they became a smaller target. So I was instructed to come back and establish a barricade between the last sighting and the task okay. force. And so in that turn, here come four of them at my 10 o'clock position, all firing. Oh, and geez. I wasn't given any instruction, but intuition and my job, uh, I turned hard into him, ended up right on the tail of number four, short burst, and he started smoking and dropping. And my uh, wingman followed him on down for, I don't know why, <laughs> but uh, he left me and uh, I didn't um, work with him anymore. Thanks a lot. So, <laughs> yeah, I already shot him. Don't go after him. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. my God. So you've got so now you're alone with uh six you've gotten one and there's six more in the fight. Somewhere. Yeah, that's right. That's oh right. my gosh. Oh. So I I think if I could um take what I know now and uh Parlay that into what I think happened was that the three remaining in the division that just lost their tail end Charlie guy pulled up abruptly and climbed smartly to 2,000 feet or so above me. And I uh, was trailing them, but uh, following. And as they turned to attack me, I switched my aim and tracking on the lead aircraft. And as I completed the um, uh, ready to attack him, they, uh, that airplane was firing at me at a distance that as far as for the weapons I had, I felt was out of range. So I just right. tracked for a while till I thought, okay, in which case I fired a brief shot and he stopped firing and turned away. And uh, as the later on, my guess <laughs> that this, the, who was the lead of all seven, uh, probably nicked him and uh, he didn't want to continue the attack. I switched my uh, aim and readiness on uh, his wingman who was heading toward me firing. And when in range, I fired at him. He stopped, didn't maneuver anything, just slid right under my airplane. I, I think he was dead. Oh. Okay, I, I have to ask right, right now, uh, Captain Williams, were you were these face shots? 
In other words, were you shooting? Were you shooting at each other, going at each other, or was there turning involved? No, it was like we were just pointing at each other. And- That's what I thought. Holy yeah. cow! That's that's uh that's that's it terrifying is. repeat what's one what's rule one when you're training right? no face shots <laughs> these guys, oh, oh my god this is okay so i'm i'm i mean uh, my, my feet are sweating my palms are sweating so you've got two uh, of so them and you're still in a fur ball though with these guys that yeah yes it, yeah the other three came in from the other side and now instead of in formation, they were individuals. It was like our uh, gunnery training of uh, right. one in, four off. Yeah, and taking their turns. Yeah, so you were, you were, you were seriously maneuvering now. Uh, yes, fighting off multiple and, attacks. And at, at what point? Uh, oh, do you remember how many rounds you had on board you know, in your gun? I think seven hundred and eighty, maybe seven hundred and twenty. Okay. Yeah. So uh we still you've yeah, got some so left though. Because it's not, uh, it's not unlimited. It's not unlimited. Of yeah, it's not unlimited. But you weren't done with these guys yet. You've gotten two of them. Now you're one V five. What what happened next? Yes. And, and maybe only four. If I really did nick this guy, I think he stayed above the fray. He was in charge of okay. the whole thing. I don't think he ran off, but uh, according to a book that uh, came out written by a military historian, that uh, two airplanes were returning to Vladivostok, and along the way, one of them dropped. I suspect that could have been the lead and was losing fuel and just uh, ran dry. And Okay. Died in the ocean. Okay. Wow. Do you, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. Do you remember the name of that book, or, or was it in Russian? The name of the book is called Red Devils Over the Red Yalu. Over the Yalu. Okay. Written by Igor Sidov, S-E-I-D-O-V. Okay, perfect. Perfect. All right. Sorry to interrupt. No, that, that, my brain there talking. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> She has. She has a. Your brain has a wonderful voice, uh, Captain Williams. <laughs> this book came out in what? By nineteen ninety-two. Oh no. Twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen. In uh, nineteen ninety-two, Soviet Union broke up, and newspapers telling the story of this nineteen fifty-two event disclosed the name of four. So I have those names, and you know, they've been published. Uh, that were shot down. Um, well, there's the confirmation. Yeah, uh, Tammy feels that maybe two more could have been lost, but could well have been other communist nation personnel flying with them, and they didn't have the right to publish their names. We don't okay. know. So in this fight that you're in. You shot down two airplanes. Nick the third. Still, yeah, possibly, probably Nick the third. So that means there's four making gun runs on you. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so, so yeah. how do you even survive this? This is amazing. So I know uh, that eventually you got a fourth, and then at some point they decided uh, that maybe you were not the right person to be hangling with, and chose the better part of valor and went home. So they could live or to try fight to another home, day. Yeah. Well, no, I don't think nope. that's the way it was. Okay, but, so I'm dying. Let's let's hear it. Well, the next one that they made a mistake, instead of abruptly climbing and getting out of it and getting up on the perch to come back, at a level point crossed me, and I uh, had a close range track and fired, and uh, it, uh, the airplane broke up. Uh, and this time back, there are fewer, but they're, they're still making runs on it. And my attention is not following who else is where, except for the guy on my tail. And I was maneuvering to louse up his aim and survive. I came on another one, and I was 
dead behind him in fairly close range. And uh, firing, he started smoking and dropping out, going low, leaving 26,000 feet. And I ran out of ammunition. And at that point, I looked around, and here's the mega on my tail. So I made a hard turn right, and uh, he got a lucky 37 millimeter into my accessory section of the engine and you know, knocked out all my hydraulics and severed the cable to the rudder. Oh, geez. Oh. The airplane was out of rig at that point. I had to really use two hands on the stick oh. to do my flying, but she sat nicely right on my tail, and I was still some distance from the clouds that were between us and the task force. But I was aimed just accidentally at the uh, clouds, and I started dropping altitude quite steep, but I pushed the stick forward and I pulled it back, and I just pulled a lot of Gs in both directions or a big yo-yo, and though he just sat back there and fired and fired, all the way until both of us got into the clouds. Uh, he didn't nail me. Thank goodness. Wow. That's that's so fortunate then. And so now you're trying to, now you have to make it back to the ship in a crippled bird. That's true. Yeah, either that or the other options weren't very popular. I can't imagine wanting to bail out uh, in that cold water. Yeah, well, my uh, intuition was that i uh, got an airplane and I've got an ejection seat. But I uh, mulled it briefly and said, hey, no one's going to come to my rescue in time to save me from uh, dying from the cold water. So obviously, I stuck with it. And I knew the base of the clouds were about four or 500 feet. So I just lowered myself down, heading toward the task force and uh, checking things as it went. And as I came out underneath the clouds uh, and leveled off, I was right near the task force. And uh, my uh, commanding officer and his flight were just launched to come up and relieve us. Uh, and he saw that the task force, who had been at general quarters, which she was, uh, hadn't been informed that I was friendly. So they were shooting at me. <laughs> of course they were. Oh, dear. He called the dog off, and I started to figure my next step to try to get aboard a carrier in uh, terrible weather and a bad airplane, and seeing at what speed I could slow to and still fly. And I got down to 170 knots, and uh, it was going to stall out. And so I had to come in above that. Wow. That is fast. Notify the landing signal officer, and uh, he's been ready for a tough job <laughs> to get me aboard. Well, I had to wait till the aircraft that had been lined up for launch for another attack on uh, North Korea. Uh, the plans had changed, and they were pulling everything forward to make room for me to land on a straight deck airplane. So it there was some time, and I'm uh, assessing myself and positioning as best I could to be the right spot when I got a Charlie permission to land. And when that happened, uh, I was in uh, fairly good shape behind the ship as it went into the wind. And uh, I let them know I was fast, of course. And the commanding officer said, uh, bring him any speed he wants. We had plenty of surface wind plus speed of the ship. Uh, but I couldn't line up. And I was going to cut crossways on the chair and would have put me over okay. the side. And the captain knew that. And as I got on in and pretty close, he whipped the ship around and lined it up with me. And boom, I landed in a fairly good landing. That's awesome. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and so uh, then you, you tail hooked, no barricade. Did they even have barricades then? Oh, yes. Okay. So that, that was pre hook. It was major on a straight deck. It was more important than on an angle deck because we had all the aircraft forward being 
arms and fuel right. and and they're doing starting that as soon as they land. Uh, but if an airplane's coming in and has a problem, they probably already put the barricade up. But they had operators right there were swift. If uh, somebody was starting to skip wires or something, they would put the bar barricade up. So that was a second defense. All right. So uh, you you uh, you said um, you you couldn't get any slower than 170. What what was a normal landing speed for a, a Panther? Uh, about 105. Oh, oh. so so you're saying. You're 65, 70 knots faster than you normally are. Uh, yeah. I never heard of anybody landing at oh, that speed. Oh, it's terrifying. You think, you know, is the cross deck pendant going to break? Yeah. Is the hook going to hold? All that. You know. right. Well, and I, I've seen that happen. Boy, that uh, is, it comes whipping across. I saw a chief penny officer out there to uh, drop the um, pendant, uh, clear the hook. And that came around and cut off both yeah. of his legs. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Dangerous place to be on a carrier deck. Oh, oh yeah. indeed. So. And if uh, if uh, my my memory's correct, because I, I uh, from my reading uh, of your event, that your aircraft was so badly battle damaged that after you uh, got out of the airplane, they, they just pushed it over. Well, we this was the last day on the line for Princeton, so we headed toward Yokosuka, and it took a little time to get there, but I received orders that on arrival to report to Admiral Briscoe, the senior naval officer in the Western Pacific, and I was uh, prepared to, when we docked, I went down on the hangar deck, and I saw second-class uh, petty officer, uh, Air Bolson, who handles these aircraft and his problem was, I was the hangar. And I told him who I was, and I'd like to have a last look at the airplane. And he says, sorry, sir, but we pushed it over the side. Well, it turns out that uh, that was not true. It probably wasn't true. And uh, Admiral Shelton, who picked up a uh, volunteer, on it started it. I look see into this thing many years later, thinking that I hadn't been properly awarded. And uh, in his study, he uh, booked all of the data on the uh, bureau numbers and found that it went into overhaul and was useful again in the training command. Nice. I'll be damned. That's beautiful. How about that? Because yeah, because Wikipedia says they pushed it over, but had uh, it had two hundred and sixty three holes in it. <laughs> yeah, that part is right. Swiss cheese of an airplane. By the time you brought her back, wow. Okay, I I have a, a couple of questions that uh, have come up since I've been listening to you talking, sir. One one question is, um, it, when you were engaged, um, when you were already engaged with those MIGs. The article I read said that you were informed by the CIC to not engage. And your reply was, I'm already engaged. Yeah. Yeah, there wasn't any choice of the matter. I couldn't turn tail, run uh, with that many ready to jump me. Right. No, that would have been, that, that, w that wouldn't have worked no. out well. No. Uh, so at what point did you... Were you told, okay, this this didn't happen because these were Russians? Uh, was was that uh, when you went to see the admiral? At first, he wanted to know what uh, was meant. Or why did the Oriskany, the carrier, put out the message that it did, which was entirely false? And uh, it was because our intelligence officer, without debriefing us, had to make a report to Washington, and, and his fertile mind came up with what he thought would be a good story and treating everybody fairly. It, but uh, that, that wasn't true, and uh, we proceeded to him say that what I'm about to tell you, you can't tell anybody ever. And then he told me about the... Uh, 
NSA um, group and first operation aboard the USS Helena Navy cruiser off the coast of Vladivostok with their team on board of monitoring. And they, they had these guys from their takeoff till the remnant came back. And they would like for the Admiral to let me know that I got at least three. And now don't tell anybody. So with that admonition, uh, I was pretty much out of the game because I felt if I'd start talking about the report, the lie that went out, I would get myself in trouble saying things I wasn't authorized to say. So I just stayed out of the fray and didn't assess uh, credit to anybody except I accepted that I got at least one. Nice. Okay. What was the official story uh, that uh, that went out, the press release or whatever that went back to, not press release, but what was the official combat yeah, what, what what was the Navy's story for fifty years? Because it was top, it, this was top secret until two thousand and two, correct? Yeah, so I don't know if they 13, said think, about the Soviets at any point. They talked about a MIG engagement uh, that I was there in the flight of four, and it ended up pretty much with just me. However, they gave credit to for my wingman for one damage. And unfortunately, he never fired a shot. And uh, the wingman from the flight lead, and I said, I need some help, was vectored on this plane. I was coming down smoking that I ran out of ammunition on. And uh, as he made a run at him, the guy ejected, and they gave him credit for their kill. Okay. That was the story. And then somebody... And I have any idea who it was, made up a mythical report that each one of us were telling about our involvement. And they had me doing things I didn't do. And these others deeply involved in twisting and turning and shooting. That never happened. That's so frustrating to not be able to say anything. Go, look, I was there. This is what happened. You know, so there I was. <laughs> wow. Can't say so nothing. There I was. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, that must have been so frustrating because what I also read was you didn't even tell your bride. No, no pillow talk on this one, even. No one at all. But, well, that what an honorable man, you know, told told this is top secret. Keep it to yourself, and you did for so many years. Did I did I also read you got to meet President Eisenhower over this? Oh, very much so. Yes, as uh, president elect, and his um, promise while he was running for president was if elected he would personally go to Korea and assess the situation. And as he came out, he declared that he wanted to see Royce Williams. Nice. And so everybody made it so. Very cool. <laughs> it happened. That's, that's, out, that's outstanding. So that was in 1952. Yes. You finished that combat tour and then did you do another combat tour in uh, Korea? No, in 53, the uh, fighting part of the war stopped. And the Pan Moon Jam agreements, uh, they made a division of North and South. And I've been there since then and down at Pan Moon Jam, which is kind of a strange place. <laughs> but... Uh, it's all the, the distance between the two countries is heavily mined and a lot of forces at the ready. Right. Oh yeah. Right. I, I I'm, I'm speechless. I am, uh, I'm so honored. Yeah. I, I know. I, we're, I, we're, where do you go? We, I, we, you know, we're, we're talking to a, 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 a we're in the presence killer. of greatness, my yeah. friend, C Captain Williams. <laughs> so we're honored. Uh, well, okay. Go ahead, Fig. Well, not no. So I want to. I want to go. Not only did you uh, fly combat missions uh, in in the Korean War, uh, but you also flew combat missions in the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. In both uh, the F four and the A four, or or just the F four. Oh, both, both. I was the wing commander on the Kitty Hawk. 
<laughs> Were you flying two the two airplanes at the same time? Yeah, the A four and the uh, oh, F four. Nice. Because it's a well, same period, <laughs> not at the same time. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay, same period. Well, that's all right. So what? Uh, now I've I've flown the A four, uh, but never the F four. So uh, between those two airplanes, which which one? Uh, which which child is your favorite? You had to <laughs> yeah, which which child's your favorite? The F four or the A four? The, uh, the A four for fun. And the F4 for fighting. Okay. Nice. I like yeah. that answer. I like that answer a lot. Well, do you recall how many hours you got in the uh, Panther? Because I know you had just a little under 100 when you, when, you, when you had the combat with the MiGs. Yeah, maybe 200, 300 hours. And when we came back, uh, we were reassigned uh, Cougars aboard the USS Boxer. Okay. And we uh, served pretty much off uh, South Vietnam, and this would be 50, late 53 and 54. And we, we, we came near to the war. We had the Third Fleet Admiral come out and join us, and we were going to be in charge of the fighting forces in Vietnam. And uh, President Eisenhower had pledged help to the French, and Dien Bien Phu operation was starting and I had a target assigned in that area with the Cougar ready to go when the communications between French and American decided uh, to shut it down. Okay. And I talked to France and they said, no, the Americans backed out. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. That, that. I, I just, according to my, recollection the truth <laughs> they, they just decided to get out of the colonial business right right and that was right the Dien Bien Phu was uh, the major disaster for the French in Indochina in Vietnam that led them to uh, basically go done we're done here yeah and it was a mess the Vietnamese uh, ended up showing force and nobody knew they had they were they would have cleaned house right there's a couple good documentaries on that, but the, the, the French lost entire classes of their military academies. It, yes. it was a total slaughter. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, they ran right in, into a trap. Right. Yeah, they thought the Vietnamese couldn't get their cannons up the hill and that sort of thing. They just disassembled them and brought them up piece by piece and put them back together. And Ingenious. <laughs> so after, a coug- after you flew Cougars... Um, what did, walk us through your uh, naval career from that point? Came back from that tour flying cou- cougars off the coast of Vietnam. Actually, I got orders in the middle of my uh, deployment to go as NAVCAD procurement officer at Miami, Florida. Started on that and got to the Philippines. We were in China and went to the Philippines and I got a Another set of orders at NAVCAD procurement officer, Akron, Ohio. So by flying in a, a kind of a borrowed DC-3, we finally got back to the States, had some farewell parties at our church, and had the movers at the house packing, but nothing in the van yet. When I get a call from Washington, D.C., report tomorrow at Apple 5, for briefings in connection with exchange duty with the Air Force. Okay. Oh, boy. So <laughs> it happened. Uh, one of my favorite assignments, I was treated so royally. I was the Air Force representative with FAA in, in Los Angeles. I was on, uh, ended up on the uh, colonel's staff and then instructing in the fighter weapons school and uh, kind of his favorite nation, I was given command of an F-86H squadron, brand new. Another and, cool uh, jet. Goodness. Unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> I am so jealous. Yeah. I, I know. I was a, a Navy lieutenant and all the other commanding officers were majors and lieutenant colonels. They could hardly wait till I got out of there to pick up some of the choice jobs that I was holding. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> so Cougars F eighty sixes air uh, exchange F one hundred. F one hundred. Okay, can you list the airplanes you haven't flown? Maybe that is a shorter list. (laughs) (laughs) GBM. (laughs) Wow. So F-86s and F-100s with the Air Force. Yes. And then at some point, uh, you you got in. I returned to the Navy at El Centro, the Fleet Air Gunnery Unit, and I was flying FJ-3s. Very similar to an F-86. And I'm getting a signal low low battery. Okay, we'll wrap this up pretty quickly (laughs) then. I do have one quick question about the whole Air Force Navy thing. That was, um, so today there's a saying that essentially is the Navy rules don't say you can't do it, then you can do it. And the Air Force rules don't say you can do it, then you can't do it. Was that the case back then or has the the Air Force changed since the, I'm assuming the, the early 60s when you were doing that? Oh goodness! Uh, yeah, I, I, I learned Air Force ways uh, pretty well. I wrote the air to ground manual, and which went along with Boost Plus "No Guts, No Glory," air to air fighting. Cool. Uh, but years, I'm skipping years ahead. I'm the commanding officer of a Phantom Squadron, and we're flying out of um, the String of Islands. Uh, out of oh, off the Keys, the Florida Keys, oh, Keys, Key, Key okay. West. Yes, 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 yes. So I'm on a, a missile shoot. So I shoot, uh, I think, a Havar, and then I shoot it down with the Sidewinder. And uh, I did that when it exploded. I went into a big victory roll, and on the top of it, loud explosions. Everything's turning red and blinking, and it, it declared a mayday. And straightened out, uh, pulled back in the power, proceeded back toward the base, lowering and gliding to use air for distance. Looked around and uh, fire on both engines. I could see it over the wings. And, and uh, so I'm mainly trying to get back to the base. But uh, I recall that in the short order recently that 16 situations like that around the world, um, including uh, Air Force, ours, and uh, Australians and Belgians and whatnot that were flying the airplane, uh, and they all ejected. And I know in the Air Force training, they say, in event of that happening, get up. Well, I've been told that, and so, I thought it's still flying and I stuck with it. And as I got down to a lower altitude and had to come up on power, more power, more power, and I had to go into afterburner to uh, keep it flying, keep extending. Uh, have my RIO eject, and then I took it in and it was a pretty dangerous situation. I had been both engines on fire and afterburner to land, but I did it and so. For the first time ever, they got an airplane back. Engineers descended on it from all over the world. And a month or so, they had solved the problem. It never happened again. Nice. Did I hear you say your backseat are ejected while while you were flying it back? He got a convertible <laughs> ride. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that itself was interesting because... There was a helicopter coming from Air Force Homestead um, to uh, okay. Key West. And all of this, he says, uh, F-4 on fire. Uh, we, we we see your uh, RIO. We'll pick him up. <laughs> and he got back faster than I did. <laughs> there's, there's a naval aviator extraordinaire for you, Fig. It was, quote, interesting. Yeah. Unquote. Yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> so, uh, you, you shouldn't get so excited about it next time you tell us that, sir. <laughs> Talk about understatement. Wow. Thank you so much. Oh, well, I've got gosh. one one other question. Of all the jobs that you did, of all the flying that you did, what was the best job that you had in the Navy? Well, my most important one, I guess, was I was the first Inspector General Sink Pack. 
Under Admiral McCain. Under Admiral McCain, you cut, you cut out. You say Admiral McCain? Yes. I served with all three of the McCains. So they needed somebody right now, and it was a two-star job, but Captain Williams was it. And so I wrote the instructions and, and the plans and made the first inspections on four-star uh, generals and so forth. And then I got relieved from the job by the most senior Air Force two star in the Pacific. Okay. And went up another job. Nice. Wow. So all the responsibility and none right. of the pay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be true. Yes. Wow. This has been just a, an amazing pleasure, Captain Williams, uh, hearing your stories. And I feel like I'm in the presence of Indeed. royalty. And if I was there, I would want to shake your hand. And unfortunately, where there's a little bit of distance between us. Um, but thank you so much for your service, first of all. I aspired to be a naval aviator extraordinaire, but no, I, I had no idea that uh, there was this, a giant shadow cast by you. Uh, there was no way I was ever going to get there. I understand you're a Marine, right? Uh, yes, sir. Both uh, repeat and I were squadron mates uh, together. Yeah, we, flew the, uh, we flew the AV-8B. Uh, B model Harrier. Yeah, I uh, was a aviator, Marine, and uh, his final assignment was on Admiral McCain's staff as a colonel. And I came aboard as his numerical relief for the Navy Department, and he retired the next day. Okay, we. I'm sorry, we got all of that except who it was. You broke up when you stated who was a naval aviator, Marine. Your oh, your brother. My brother. Okay. okay. Oh, your brother. The same Lynn. brother that checked you out in the Corsair? Exactly. <laughs> that, that's How awesome. awesome is that? That's awesome. Is, is he still with us? Oh, he died on, yeah, 4th of July, two years ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What was his name, sir? 98. He wasn't a young okay. fellow. It, what was his name? Was it a young, he wasn't a young fella, he said. Lynn, Lynn Willie. They want to know his name. Yeah, yeah Lynn. Awesome. Lynn. Well, and thank you to thank you to your brother for his service. You you have a family with a tradition of service and sacrifice, and, and I am so grateful, not only for your service, but for your time that you have honored us with your presence. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. More humbled that you're here with us. And I hope the campaign yeah. is successful. I I believe fully in my heart that you are worthy of the medal of honor sir and i hope that they uh come to their Amen. senses and and and, uh, and award that right. to you as it should have been done 70 years ago um right know, just you know, thanks sir what a, what a true honor it, it has been uh talking yeah, with you personally indeed. thank you for your time well it was enjoyable thank, thank you. you well <laughs> i think I, I just feel like that we've got about six six months worth of stories to pry out of you, but that right. would, that's not <laughs> going to happen if, today. If you're willing to come yeah. back sometime, we would love to have you back. Well, there are other stories. <laughs> oh, we've got to get them. I, I know. I Oh, my gosh. You know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I, I can't wait to hear the Phantom and the A4. Well, the fact that he talked about being on fire in an F4 and his Rio jumped out that, like he was standing on the corner waiting for a taxi cab yeah. to go by. <laughs> <laughs> that was an interesting day. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Well, sir, yeah. we know you've got a low we'll battery, so we'll let you go. We'll do, we'll do away with the most of the formalities that we usually do, all show announcements and that kind of stuff, and, and just say thank you and God bless you. And, and please, if you're willing to come back, we would love to have you. Um, it would be a joy. Very God cool. bless you. Well, we're yeah. going to take you up on that, sir. So, thank you so much. Uh, all right. I'll have there a list of questions. Good. I just <laughs> want to thank you both as well, and I'll be in touch with you. and. Um, I really appreciate you spending the time with uh, Captain Williams today. It was all our honor, all our honor and privilege. Yes, absolutely. Well, we're, we're going to need your you're going to need your support. Why don't you like to see you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thank you um, for helping we today. Have, thank you. We still have um, work cut out on this Medal of Honor, and we're not giving up. Um, so I'll, I'll look forward for your support Absolutely. for that. Absolutely, whatever oh, we can do. Uh, we, we can help 
anything we can do, uh, we'll do it. Absolutely. Uh, All right. We have a good, uh, well, we have a pretty good following so far. And we'll so any of you people listening that. have any people that can make this happen? Get busy. Get busy. Right. <laughs> Contact your senators. The Congress, the House has already approved it. Be well. God bless. Semper Fi. Semper Fi. Thank you, sir. Well, Captain Williams, thank you so much for your time with Fig and me today. We are deeply honored that you spent time with us, and we look so much forward to having you back and hearing more of these stories uh, that were, as you put them, interesting. <laughs> right? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> right? Our gratitude also goes out to Dave Hamilton over at the Mac Geek Gap. Folks, here's the, some of the feedback that I get over and over again. Please go to our website. So there I was dot us. We have a glossary page there. Go look up all these terms. We know there's a lot of terms that you get hit with during the show, and it's hard to listen to if you don't know what they are. But if you'll go to our page, glossary page there. And so there I was dot us. If you don't see what you're looking for, shoot us an email. Repeat at so there I was dot us or fig at so there I was dot us. And ask us to get it up on the page. Ask us what it is. We've had a few emails like that, and we've got them up on the glossary page. Thanks also to our sponsor, Robin's Bird Brain Designs. Custom etching on just about anything that's uh, etchable. If you need to customize a gift some, for somebody, robinsbirdbraindesigns.com, and she'll take care of you. I have some, and they're amazing. The lawman got some with the Blue Angels. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. It looked like they were playing beer can right. formation, too. We're getting closer. They were a beer can <laughs> with, right? Yeah. <laughs> what, I saw 65? Are we up, up to 65, 65 followers? followers? We need 35 Rumble? more of you. Get off your backsides right 35. now. Go to 35 so more. there I was dot US slash Rumble, and please sign up and follow us so we don't have to pay. It's, it's free. free. Doesn't yeah. cost you You'll anything. get a note. And once we get 100, we won't have to pay anything to be on Rumble. And I think you can unsubscribe to them if you Help want to, but out. you would get emails saying, hey, they're recording today. Thank you to everybody who has been sharing this show. Share, 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 share. Keep sharing it. Our audience is growing exponentially. You know, I've gotten feedback, too, from uh, friends that are not a in the aviation business, and they are in love with this show right. uh, just because it's something different. You know, we don't talk politics. Okay. Uh, it's a chance to get away from the crazy out there in the world and just listen to good stories. Listen to the crazy that is aviation. <laughs> yes. So if you know people that just like a good story, you don't have to be a pilot to enjoy this show. Keep sharing it. And lastly, thanks to our friends, the Dos Gringos, the two men who give the Air Force a great name, great music that brings us in and brings us out every week. We're so appreciative, and hopefully they'll come back soon and chat a little more about some of their exploits in the airplanes. I'd like that. So be well, everybody. Until next week, stay safe, man. Check six. I do remember all right after take off to stock in Top Gun, but I don't want to land. Allow me to explain and you'll understand. It ain't so much the landing Hell, why would I care? You never have a crosswind And you never have to flare Another MiG came round and Williams managed to get his sights on him and fired. The MiG blew up, Williams narrowly avoiding the massive fireball. When he looked back and saw another Soviet plane coming in, he wove and jigged to foul the Soviets' aim, but a burst of fire found the Panther hitting a wing and the engine. He managed to pull up hard, cannon shells roaring past his canopy as he did so, and dived into cloud cover. He performed an extremely hazardous carrier landing. Lieutenant Williams is credited with four Soviet MiG-15 kills. After the Cold War ended in 1991, the Russian government confirmed that Williams had downed four of their pilots, including their names.